Hello folks, I thought I would give you a Dynasty tanking guide video off the back of the Lazarus tanking guide video and the fact that it's mutation run this week. Um, there's still a few days left to run mutation runs. Now I know before anyone says in the comment section, why would you bother? Uh, the gear is bugged, the loot is bugged, um, it's overtuned, why would you waste your keys? Firstly, I don't play the game strictly for loot, I do play the game also for fun and I do happen to enjoy this expedition so I, I recommend you run it if you want to do those things as well and that's the reason why I continue to do so. Uh, is the loot bugged? Absolutely, we know it's bugged. Will we get compensation for the loot? I have no idea but that's not my number one concern. My number one concern really is Umbral Shards and I can get that on this expedition as well as the others. Um, is Dynasty overtuned? No, I don't think so. I fundamentally believe the biggest problem with Dynasty versus Genesis and Lazarus is that we've all got a little bit fat uh, in terms of running Genesis and Lazarus into the ground, that we know those mechanics inside and out, but we don't know the mechanics on Dynasty inside and out either. And the problem with that is we're all a little bit rusty when we go into it. So when we're getting hit by the boss and dying, we're like, oh, this is overtuned, versus we're not really getting hit by the Genesis boss or the Lazarus boss particularly. So yeah, I don't feel the same way. Um, and I think that after, you know, kind of like five runs of having done it, I did some normal and then some early mutation levels. I started to get a hang of the mechanics again. And now I'm firmly of the view that this dungeon is not overtuned in the slightest. So in fact, I think it's probably easier than Lazarus for me as a, from a tank perspective. Anyway, um, a good tank can really make this dungeon so much easier for your team. And I'll give you a couple of key reasons why. What we're going to do is um, I've recorded um, some of my Twitch footage because I stream these mutation runs. We've done up to mutation eight on stream. Um, we've got some mutation six footage today just because um, it, it's a little bit easier to think about in mutation eight. I was so focused on what I was doing that I can't really think about it. So we're just going to do a six run. Um, it's probably good in a sense. I imagine most people can get to that level without having to do the higher tiers. We'll talk about my build. We'll talk about my tactics um, in, in terms of like a reaction video on it. Um, and I apologize. This video is coming out to you in 720p rather than nine rather than 1080p. Um, the reason for that is the Twitch stream goes out in that lower setting just to enable more viewers to come in without bandwidth issues. So um, not as good clarity as my normal New World videos, but that's a one-off for you. I apologize about that. Um, let's get straight into it. Okay, so I, I, haven't, I, know I would need to respect, but basically my build is around 320 con. Then I put myself at 50 decks for the crit chance and everything else in strength. 320 con is good enough to get you about with a hearty um jewelry piece to get you around 16,000 hp which is i think more than sufficient um and it will give you a sufficient amount of dps as well not that i think dps is critical here but it will work for you in a couple of ways um there's a couple of times where you can really pitch in that's particularly on the on the barrel keg section um and more fundamentally i just think much more than that is a bit overkill then we'll look at the builds themselves uh this is my tanking guide uh this is my tanking build that i'm using for the mutation runs now, there are two different variants of this, depending on how strong I think my team is. This week, the team I did the orb share with was really strong. And so I opted for leadership just to increase our DPS. And that is really helpful in some occasions. If you feel like you're losing a little bit too much or you're a little bit frail, then I would definitely take defensive formation just to reduce that damage towards your allies, keep them alive a little bit longer. And more importantly, you can take some more points on this side of the tree on the defender tree. And particularly these three perks I really like which is the reduction in stamina damage, um, which is going to let you get your shield up for longer, and the, and the fortify when you block an attack. And these are really good because what happens at the high level mutations is there are so many enemies exploding, you can get stun locked really quickly. If, uh, if like three enemies explode around you, that is you poise broken and you're going to get hit sufficiently. So actually just being able to take those little bit of da uh, damage mitigations things lets you take one more explosion and the fortify on it helps when you do get hit anyway. Um, so I think that's really, really good. And you can also handle it with Invigorating Bulwark just to give you a bit more stamina when you use your Shield Bash. But as always, the reason why we take both Defiant Stance and Shield Bash is the two taunt ability. I think that's super important there. Defiant Stance being a crowd taunt, which is fantastic. And then Shield Bash, just to let you get those single mobs that have run away. I think that's really important. And then Contagious Reverse Stab. Sorry, not Contagious Reverse Stab. You need that on your armor. Uh, reverse Stab which is really useful to get your cooldowns. Unfortunately, this is going to get nerfed. That's on the PTR right now, I believe. They're going to stop reverse stab from being able to reduce reverse stab cooldowns. So how this used to work and how this one might work in the video if I've picked up the right stream is um, you can reverse stab, defiant stance, reverse stab, defiant stance, reverse stab, defiant stance. And especially where these bits where there's loads and loads of enemies that group up, 
you can get full cooldown recharge. You're no longer going to be able going to be able to do that on the new patch, but we could endure on this patch at least. And then I would say there's one perk that's absolutely S tier on this run, which is freeing justice, which is when you hit an enemy with a heavy attack, it causes you to lose one debuff. There are a lot of enemies here that apply rend and apply bleed to you. And especially when you're having a rendered applied to you, which means you're going to take additional damage. Being able to get rid of that with a heavy attack is so important. It's actually a super defensive move. You can also use Contagious Reverse Stab to pass it on. But if you don't have a Contagious Reverse Stab armor piece, armor piece, then running Freeing Justice is absolutely critical as well. Then what else did I run? Um, in different sections, I ran a Void Gauntlet at the boss. And the reason I run a Void Gauntlet at the boss is mostly for two things. One is Oblivion, just to empower my teammates and to apply some Weaken to the boss. That's really efficient. Essence Rupture, because this enemy, the boss won't die. So actually, Essence Rupture will allow my teammates to heal themselves. And then I run Scream just to root things along the way. Um, and that's quite useful. Uh, that is the build. But in reality, I didn't run that for most of the expedition. As I mentioned in Lazarus, I know in my Lazarus guide video, which the cards above you now, if you want to know how to tank mutated Lazarus, I really recommend running the hatchet. And there's two reasons for that. Um, there is a bit of a bug on the hatchet damage at the moment, which um you know it's going to be gone at some point so don't bank on it really what we're using here is berserk berserk is the single best proud taunt in the game even better than defiant stance um it has a bigger radius and i think it lasts a little bit longer as well or well, one of those things is is larger on berserk than it is defiant stance um which is really effective and the additional damage output now we, we can also combine this with is against all odds so with Against All Odds, you get an increase in base damage by 10% for every enemy within 5 meters. No, it's base damage, not kind of output damage. So it's not quite 10%. It's a little, it's less than that. But in reality, you can have lots and lots of enemies surrounding. You combine that with Berserk for the additional attack damage of 20% by 12 seconds is a really significant buff and can, put, can get outputs from you in terms of DPS on par with your bruisers, um, which I really, really like. A rending throw is always fantastic just to apply some rend to enemies, especially if you're from distance, you get that additional rend up to 15%. And then infected throw. I like infected throw because it weakens the target. So there isn't really vampiric on this week's modifier for Muria's server, the server I'm on anyway. So um, having disease isn't, isn't massive, although there are a lot of corrupted enemies that potion themselves. So they are creating healing and this disease will stop that healing or mitigate that healing somewhat by 30%. But mostly I'm using it for the weaken, the weaken of 10%, especially when you have this cloud debuff, the aerial transmission, you can weaken a lot of enemies here, which is just going to let your teammates stay alive for a little bit longer. And then, of course, you do have to fire death, which is a little bit buggy this week in this patch at the moment, but is working on occasion. So still worth taking. These two things give me effectively three taunts and enough DPS to keep my aggro up high, relatively speaking, um, for most of the most of the run. So anyway, let's get into the footage. Okay, I mean, first things first, what you're not seeing off the screen here is I'm applying um, the corrupted coatings to both my weapons. Uh, I'm applying a honing stone. Um, hon powerful honing stones are super expensive, so I ran strong honing stones for most of this. And I'm applying some food, so I'm actually running the um, convergence cake, which is plus 33 strength. But anything like a carrot cake or whatever's relevant to your build is important. From a tank perspective, really, you'd be looking at either the constitution food, carrot cake, or convergence cake, something like that. Um, will buff your abilities, will buff your attributes, sorry, rather. Um, and then carrying, make sure in terms of potions, you definitely want infused health, infused regen, hearty meals, yes. And then either corrupted ward potions or powerful gemstone dust. You can see when I come into the ability here, the first thing I do is I use a berserk crowd taunt. The reason for the berserk crowd taunt there is just to get everyone's aggro. And you can see they're all grouped up and then my team are popping that gravity well straight away just to hold all of the enemies in place. That's going to be super effective for you there. And you can see here I've started to lose some aggro. But that guy on the right was really low, so there's no point worrying too much about him. Um, I'm starting to cycle through on some of my abilities here with Pop and Berserk again. That'll give me the aggro back again. You can see the explosion is really starting to create an impact. But nothing too bad in this first section here. You can need to go quite fast to try and get this on the timer. Um, I didn't find the timer for this dungeon run too bad compared to Lazarus. I actually think that this is a little bit easier in many respects. Um, but from there, we're going to move straight up to the next section. Uh, one of the things you'll notice in this guide video is that we leave all of the chests. You can actually come and loot all of the chests after the final boss. So don't waste your time looting along the way. Come back after you've killed the boss if freely to collect the loot. It's not too big a dungeon either, so it doesn't take too long to cycle back through. Um, when you get to the top here, I mean, so many of these enemies are exploders. 
So you have the option of getting a ranged DPS to aggro all of those mobs and get them over. You see I start pulling them here. And then at this point, gravity well coming in. And what I want to do is that reverse stab there, that reverse stab to get me a full cooldown, hopefully. I didn't manage to get it this time, but I did get a significant amount back. So my Defiant Stance is almost back up already, which is super good. I'm here and we're just watching out for the boss. The boss starts to come up now. You can kind of line of sight it a little bit for your ranged DPS to keep everyone a bit safe. I'm coming here. This attack there, the lightning attack that comes down, bypasses the shield, or at least did on some occasions for me. So when you see that lightning attack come down, when the when the summoner puts the shield, puts its uh sorry, mage staff in the ground, and this is the lightning attack about to happen, I think it's best to dodge it at this point rather than just try to tank it with your sword because I had inconsistent results with it. Um, the flames, flame buffs on the wall, sorry, the, the flame kind of portals around you cause significant damage, especially at the higher mutation level. So you want to be taking the ruby gems to mitigate that, or it could be void on your server, which means you need amethysts. Um, or opals. Opals give you a flat 2.5% uh, elemental resistance. And there is quite a bit of magical damage in this dungeon. So I thought opals were the way to go. In fact, on my armor pieces, I had a mix of opals and rubies. And I am running heavy void bent. So you know, I'm by no means running an optimal armor set here. I'm firmly of the view that just taking, um, getting something up to 625 for mutation 10 runs is probably going to be the sensible thing and then kind of optimizing after you get there. Now, once you've killed that boss, that mini boss, a whole load of these little swarmers start to swarm again, start to respawn, sorry. So again, you see a theme here. I pop the crowd ability. We try and draw them near us. We use a gravity well and then a maelstrom from the Great Axe Bruiser people to really try and take out so many of them really quickly. Uh, keep on spawning, watch out for the explosions. Your healer needs to be really on point here. Your healer can't afford to worry too much about DPS. They really do have to keep the tank alive because there's so many enemies here. And with the explosions, it's really quick to lose health quickly. So uh, I feel like you need sacred ground um, and your healer needs to be on point just focusing on the tank uh, because things go south so quickly. So a couple of times in the runs, you might notice that I do go really low and, I, and you won't see it because I'm doing the voiceover on top of it. But at some point I do say to my healer, stop healing dps you must just heal me because without what one of the things we found is without a tank this run goes south so quickly there's just too many ads and without someone being able to hold all that aggro it's really really difficult they normally target the healer the healer can't get the heals away the dps then go down do yourself a favor uh you technically can leave the two the two enemies right there on the beach but we always managed to get them because without it we normally were two enemies short of the 60 um, enemies needed for the gold run so we always made sure we got those two but again here, we cycle it all up between all of us, and there must be a good amount, 10 enemies there. That that taunt is super effective. And you can see there, that taunt did get me a full Defiant Stance back. Now, you don't want to put the Defiant Stance straight away because you're low, and you're going to take damage while you're doing that, so you could actually die. So I went back into the Sacred Ground, I let myself get healed, and then pop the Defiant Stance again. That's going to just make sure I keep all of the aggro for a little bit longer, and then hopefully chain it back in with the Reverse Stab as well. Nice Sacred Ground popped on me from the healer there. Uh, we're going to um, use our Berserk ability, and we're just going to keep the shield up here. The thing to worry about here is the Spearmen. The Spearmen do apply Rend on you. So again, you want to be using that heavy attack to cleanse yourself of that. And then it also, it also has a lot of these kind of tanky enemies, the Warriors, that put their shield up. You want to be using your heavy attack because the heavy attack will exhaust their stamina a little bit faster and let your DPS do it. One person stay behind there to, loot, um, to light the powder kegs and put the powder kegs in place. We do the same thing for the second half of the room. We're going to go around and get all of the aggro. And then we're going to crowd taunt them, and then we're going to bring everyone together. This one's a bit of a more disparate group. What you want to try and do, you can see what we did here, is there is a musket user right here. You want to bring them on the musket user, because when you taunt, the musket user won't really come to you. It quite happily shoot you from distance and can just be a little bit annoying. So actually, if you bring everyone with the taunt and the gravity well right on top of the musket user, you can normally kill the musket user within this mix and just buy yourself that kind of time to, to kind of deal with it, which is really nice. Um, lots of debuffs again. Uh, Warhammer on your bruiser here is, is really good, actually, because just those stuns buy you time to apply the maelstrom and things like that. I mean, our, our team abilities, sorry, our team build here was a healer, a tank, um, and I'm running sword and shield hatchet. Healer was running Void Gauntlet Life Staff. Um, we have one range DPS who kind of switched to Great Axe on occasion, but mostly ran Bow. Uh, and then we have two Great Axe Warhammers who also switched to Hatchet when we needed it as well. And the reason why they might have switched to Hatchet is 
a little bit more DPS on certain situations when we didn't need the Warhammer debuffs, probably speaking. So you've got to apply all of those um, all of those powder kegs, all of those rockets. We come in here. Now we got to start to get a bit more sophisticated. There are four mobs in this room. Well, three plus a boss. I run straight past them all and I shoulder bash the boss. The reason for that is the boss causes significant damage. So what you want to do as the tank is you want to draw the boss away. You see here I draw the boss away and I let my DPS handle those three enemies with the healer. I don't get any heals here. I tell my healer, do not heal me because this boss is so easy to kite. You can see here I'm just running past the projectiles and I'm, I'm doing that with sword and shield. And as long as you stay out of the range of that kind of orb hit attack, you're OK. The only thing to worry about is the flame, which causes a little bit of a problem, but you can pot up. Unfortunately, when that attack does hit, you get disease, so it stops your healing. But that attack there, the dragon going round and round, is so telegraphed. If you see it on the floor, just get out of it. Um, we're not here to cause damage at this point. I tried to cleanse myself there, even though I didn't have anything. That was a bit silly. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not here to cause damage here, folks. So you're probably going to die as a tank in this situation here if you try to get greedy. But realistically, all you need to be doing is holding this aggro, letting your DPS kill those three mobs. And then once we do that, we can absolutely gang up on the boss there. Sometimes if you run too high up the steps, the boss will follow you. And what we found is there were some really janky hitboxes with the boss on the stairs. So I really recommend trying to stay down at the bottom of the stairs if you can, just to make those things a little bit quicker. You can actually shield that ability there, the dragon. Uh, it will apply a significant amount of stamina. So you, you can do it when you have full stamina. Um, but I think it's better just and safer just to get out of it. In fact, it's probably easy because if you get the flame shield down, the flame um, debuff down as well, then you get a bit significant. This is where Hatchet kind of comes into its own here because when the bosses start doing that, you can apply the rend and a diseased throw from distance quite safely. Just watch out for the diseased throw. It kind of launches you in a little bit sometimes, so you can get caught out by that. But you can see here we deal with this room relatively easily. So we walk up the stairs. I actually think that this area here is kind of one of the more difficult areas on the whole dungeon because there's a different way to do it here. So what happens now is this... Um, I used to just tank the big guy, okay? But what started to happen is as all of the slicers started to come down, it started to get a lot more difficult. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll tank not just the slicer, I'll also tank one of the um, one of the mages as well. And this makes things a lot harder. When you just have the big guy, you can pretty much keep your shield up the whole time, dropping it for stamina regen. But every time you do that, um, you can pretty much tank all of his attacks. What I found is without putting DPS out on this mage, you lose the aggro on it really quickly. So I have to come back for shield bash here and the flame comes down and I die. So that is a really, really tough thing to do. You do need your healer to work with you, but the healer will be working on DPS. So the run starts to go south a little bit, but I wanted to include this clip because you can just see how to recover here. So we normally had one person kind of kite around, wait for that slicer to go, which is an absolute bloody nightmare. The healer is doing a really good job on dodging, dodging the big guy. But we don't try to DPS here. We just play safe. We disengage. We kite. We stay alive. Bring it back now. Now I'm potting up. Now I'm going to get this aggro. And we're going to be fine here. We're going to start to regain the situation. Pop the Defiant and just hold there. I can actually take the flames not too bad, especially when I'm in the Defiant, because I'll have significant armor reduction. And luckily, our DPS managed to get one of the mages down in the meantime. So now I can just focus back on this guy. And you can see here, it's really easy. Just kite around. Keep your shield up. Okay. He does have one ability, which sometimes kind of bypasses your shield, but in all honesty, it probably does like 2k damage, so not significant at all. All you've got to do at these points is every time he has his telegraphed attacks are so slow to wind up, you need to drop your shield for the stamina regen. That's the only reason we're dropping the shield there, is to keep our stamina regen up. I don't even have sturdy on this shield. Um, I'd actually left my sturdy shield in the storage at this moment in time. And we go back and get it after this run, because sturdy is probably an S-tier perk for a tank. But um, because this isn't too difficult, I've said, oh, it's fine with this. I um, did have to eat my words when I when I got um, killed, of course. But I think if I had sturdy, I probably would have been able to survive that. So here's what it is. Um, we're just letting the DPS now focus on that last mage. We're holding the aggro here on this guy so easily. It's not a challenge at all. You should also be able to tell your healer at this point, don't heal me. I want you to focus purely on DPS because I should not be dying. If I die at this point here to the solo big guy, uh, that's just bad play for me. You see here that kind of attack had like a five attack wind up and I just kept the shield up the whole time. You can actually do that. It's fine. You can dodge if you like, but there's really no need to. The shield is more than sufficient. Assuming you're running a tower shield, of course, if you're running a round shield or a kite shield, I can't guarantee that. But I would recommend for this kind of run, you're always running tower shield rather than a kite shield. So at this point, the DPS starts coming. You've probably built up such sufficient threat 
by holding the aggro for so long that it's actually really hard to lose. But in any event, we'll keep on popping Define just for the armor reduction anyway. Applying that rend into the boss, keeping the shield up just to let the DPS come in. And I think it's really important here just to try and be steady for your DPS because what you want is you want your DPS to be able to attack from the back cleanly uh, without getting realistically hit by the big guy because he can do some damage. And if you kite around too much and turn the big guy, then of course they can get hit in the kind of the uh, the crossfire that can happen. So it's really important that to be a good tank in this dungeon, you need to be really dependable and predictable so that your DPS can move around you and make sure they stand behind you. You see, I've got two really good DPS here in Wix and Dalegard from my company, and they always get behind the big guy. And I'm kind of nice and steady and just making sure I do slow rotations, 90 degree kind of rotations, just to make it so it's easy to read. And I constantly move around in the circle and they can move around behind the big guy. Uh, he is very tanky. He's got a lot of health. You can do heavy attacks to deplete his stamina, but the longer it goes on, the faster his stamina uh, regen seems to get. So it doesn't quite work out in that way. Uh, but we're all done there. I think I might even get an exotic from this piece. Looked like I did. Probably just some bloody Crest of Fortitude or something. I don't know because the loot is so rubbish. Um, we're going to move on to the next section now, which is the barrel keg section. The barrel keg section is a bloody pain because it feels like whilst they buffed every enemy in this expedition for the mutation, they didn't buff the life of the powder kegs. So it's almost like two or three spearmen hit on the powder keg can, can blow up. So you can lose some really significant time here because you could spend kind of five minutes and if it blows up at the end, you've lost all that time. You've got to start from the beginning. It's a real bloody nightmare. So there's a really specific build here. Um, hopefully it's on this video that we try to run and, and we've got some real good success when one of us equipped an ice gauntlet. And you didn't need to invest in any intelligence or anything like that, but it was just for ice shower. Um, ice shower and ice storm, anything like that just applies that freeze that frost ability and slow ability to all of those enemies, you're going to be able to stop them rushing straight towards the barrels. Because the problem with the barrels is when the enemies come in, you're going to see it in a moment, I'll taunt. But they run straight past the taunt and they run for the barrel and they normally get one hit in on the barrel. And once they've done that, they then turn around and come back for you. Well, at that point, it's too late because you can't afford that every time the barrel will die. So you need something else to break their charge to the barrel. And that's normally a hit if you can hit the enemies, but it's difficult with the volume to hit all of them. So we had two options. Slow or root, basically. Uh, and the root is the petrifying scream from the void gauntlet. That was used really super effectively just to root those enemies. Uh, or it was the gravity well or ice gauntlet just to apply those abilities as well. You can see here, you've lit the powder cake here, and then you get these kind of enemies spawn from a 360 degree angle. So I tried to hit that guy there. The gravity well goes in to slow it down preemptively. And at that point, look, they're still charging. I've applied the taunt, they're still charging, but luckily we managed to stop them. So if you get enough hits, they seem to break their line of sight towards the barrels. And in all honesty, these enemies aren't too tough. So you can really try afford to kind of go ham on them here. That guy's charging in and he gets a hit on it. Even though we managed to hit him on the way in, didn't get the taunt in, but I guarantee if I got the taunt, it wouldn't have made any bloody difference. He would run straight for it. Um, sacred ground coming down, and that just lets you going to do big DPS. You want to focus all the enemies in the group if you possibly can. That makes things easier. You've got to watch out for those explosions. Those explosions will knock you over the fence ultimately. And whilst you can get back up on the boat, it's really janky. So I don't try to recommend it too much. Um, it's more of the same here, to be honest with you guys. I'm not going to go too much more into this. We'll skip forward into the next section, but this is more of the same. Once you've got this section down, what you need to understand is one of you needs to be at the back to, uh, to deal with the ad that spawns at the back behind you. The rest of you need to be on this crossroad section. You need to be putting down a preemptive gravity well, if you can, or ice storm, ice gauntlet to slow all the enemies down. Your tank should be taunting in this section to pull the aggro. And once you've done that, you should have the aggro on you and they shouldn't hit the barrel. That's the safest way we did it. When we did mutation six, seven and eight, we did this strat every single time and we never lost the barrels once. So it is super effective. You can see here that gravity well just slows them down, lets you get a big stun hit on them and then they won't, they don't go for the barrel anymore. They start to come for you. OK, so then we move straight into the next section, which is the next barrel keg section. Um, more of the same here. Uh, we're going to rush straight in here. Unfortunately, we lost the aggro there, so I've got to try and do something about it. I whiff one throw, managed to get the second throw. Don't get him quite back yet. Realistically, the DPS should wait for me to come in before we do that. But it's only these three enemies, and it's not too bad here. Um, we're going to put out some DPS to try and get the aggro. You can see I've got all three now. I would like to get them grouped. Putting that oblivion down is helpful because it empowers you and gives you 
the stamina regen um, plus 15, like every one second almost, it feels like, which is super good for the tank. So Oblivion pairs so nicely here. Unfortunately, one of our DPS go down. Not quite sure how, but we regroup no problem. Getting these guys down quickly is, is really helpful. Um, is this section harder than the previous section? Good question. Uh, I'd probably say it's ever so slightly harder, only because the kegs here are a little bit more open. You know, in the previous section, there is that first box, the uh, first uh, bunch of boxes to stop them coming in. There's only one ad that spawns behind. So whilst there's one ad that spawns behind here, we're actually in a much more open section. So it's a little bit harder to crowd control. So what we do here is something very, very specific, which is what I want to demonstrate to you. So we're going to place those kegs down. The ads will start spawning in. And sacred ground going down now, just because we know this is where the damage is going to be. We all stand in it. Gravity well straight away just to get them in. I taunt just to pull some aggro. You can see that you can see that one of them still went for the barrel, but we've got them all grouped up here. A second grav well to hold them. And at this point now, we put the oblivion down and we try to wipe out. So again, you need to preemptively apply that grav well and apply that um, slow debuff to all of the enemies here just to stop them getting into that section. We're going to rinse and repeat that mechanic for a few turns. And then we're going to move on to the next section. Just to show you here again, Gravity Well preemptively, they all come in. We crowd taunt to kill the aggro. And at this point, we look pretty good. Maelstrom to pull them all in. And at this point, they're definitely not going to attack the barrels. They're too focused on me now, which is good. You see at mutation kind of, I think five, you get this kind of um, flame thing that comes around you. You know, in reality, the, the damage from it was like 2k to all of your enemies. So as long as your um, teammates stay outside of it, it's absolutely fine. And even if your teammates are inside it, as long as there's a sacred ground down or something, you'll definitely be able to tank it. it. It doesn't do much damage at all. Okay, we're moving up to Isabella now, kind of, I suppose, the first kind of serious boss in this dungeon. And the thing with Isabella is she does have some quite potent abilities that dish out a lot of damage, and you need to be able to hold the tiger's aggro. So if you've done this at level 55, when you're doing the main campaign, you might remember this boss. Um... She comes in here, she's going to do a bit of talking. You can really wail in some damage here at the beginning section. So that's what you want to do. You see, we're getting ready for it here. We're going to come in and wail that damage straight off the bat. Because the boss doesn't do anything here. I like to apply a shield rush just to get all the aggro. And then they do the maelstrom just to kill those adds straight off the bat. It was a really nice clean run. Um, she does have a ranged ability. So she's basically a, a dex rapier user, right? She's very fast, very mobile. She's got quite swift attacks. She does that kind of arcane blast. That you can iframe through, but I actually did a really bad time in there, so that was on me. She's quite easy to kite, and you can keep your shield up, of course, as well. That attack can deal some quite significant damage, and you can get poise broken there. If you don't, if you kind of go in not 100, you can get poise broken, and that can punish you because you can do that combo back to back before you can even have your stamina up. So you won't have the dodges if you've extend if you're exhausted, and you won't have the ability to put your shield up. Quite dangerous. Nice stuns there from the team. Then she takes this knee section. She's going to teleport over here. At this point, you're going to have some musket users on the bridge. That's why you want a ranged DPS or live staff or both to be able to deal with the musket users. These cannonballs come over. That's telegraphed every time. You can see them coming over. Um, don't go too crazy here because she does have an invincibility section there. So I actually wasted that rending throw, but not too bad. More fireballs coming over. We're still holding the aggro. At this point, you really must make sure you hold Isabella's aggro because if it goes on DPS and they're not expecting it, they can get wiped out pretty quickly. You can kind of line of sight her back on this cage here, which is you can see what I did there just to make sure that teleport um, attack didn't do much for me. Fortunately, again, I mistimed that section. You can see here I didn't actually play this particularly well, but we're not having any real drama. So it's nothing to worry about this boss. I think people think this boss is much harder than it is. You just need to play somewhat sensibly and you'll be absolutely fine. We've nearly done enough damage to the boss that she'll go away and we're onto the tiger section, which is really good. Take the defiant stance when you feel like it's getting close because that's just going to let you survive. And at this point, you, make, you want to make sure you survive. You make, want to make sure that you don't die because if you die, the run can go south quickly. So as you're so close to just moving on to the next section, pop the defiant just to keep you alive. Once she takes this knee, it's fine. You haven't got to go wailing in on damage here. She's going to go away. At this point, you need to focus on one tiger. Tank needs to hold one tiger. The rest of your team need to deal with the other tiger. I tell my healer here to not heal me. Focus all of your heals on the DPS. This is the easiest tanking enemy in the whole game. You should not need a heal. You should not get hit, rather than your own stupidity. I will kind of shield bash. We miss it. 
I do a taunt, but this guy will always run over there and then run back to you. He's a real bloody nightmare. Um, so you can see there he kind of ran over. Unfortunately, I did the shield bash miss because he has janky hitboxes. But at this point here, you just need to hold your, your, your um, shield up the whole time. So shield up, breath attack. The breath attack is only a first impact. You can actually drop the shield straight after you've had the impact and you won't get rendered or take any damage. Don't worry about the rest of the breath. It's only the initial impact. But you can see here, look, all I do is put my shield up, put it down. Every single time, shield up, shield down, wait ready for the next attack, put the shield back up. That's all you have to do for this whole tiger. You don't have to attack. You don't have to try and keep aggro too much. You don't have to do anything else. You get everything. Unfortunately, there I get stun locked because I um I tried to attack in the middle of that and got oh I got too cocky for my own good, really. And my ego said, Oh, you can get an attack in death. Um, yeah, that was my own stupidity. You don't need to do that, you need to play it safe. Do your team a favor, stay alive, and just play it super cool. I didn't even need to potion there, so I don't know why I did. We tried to take a corrupted board potion just to keep me on the safe side. Heavy attack to cleanse, but I said this this guy's hitboxes are awful. So I missed two heavy attacks somehow. Um, but we're safe now. Because the team have wiped out the other tiger, so they can focus on this one. And again, you've held aggro for so long at this point that your threat is so high, you don't even have to really worry about attacks. If you do need to worry about attacks, I'll just put in a crowd taunt. If you get hit by the breath, you are rendered. Don't get too scared and go, I need to heavy attack quickly to get rid of that rend, because the boss does attack very, very frequently. Try and do it in between attacks if you can. So keep calm is the key to this guy, because he's very, very easy to tank. Just don't lose your cool. Keep it calm. Deal with them slowly. You can see there, no drama at all. Next section, this kind of hallway section, you want to deal with these two mobs here and then the first boss up there. So we kind of pull these guys in. The range DPS will, will deal with the musket user up there um, just to try and pull aggro. We'll try and go ham on the spearman. Uh, again, the spearman can apply Ren to you, so just watch out for that heavy attack. Once you've done that, you're going to pull in this uh, boss. You're going to do that with your range DPS, and you don't want to take the boss too early, because if you take the boss too early, you'll pull a load of mobs. So we kind of line of sight it. Now, you can do that at the gate, or you can do it down there. Now that the boss is down here, Summer Wang, you can actually just sit here and tank. Um, you're not going to pull any aggro here. You kind of want to do it quickly. Now, what, what you do want to do, watch out for the slicer, of course, is kind of chain. So you see the boss there was going to do a kind of a big damage attack. She'll bash it, knock it out of it, and CC chain it. If you, if you can do that, you're going to constantly interrupt the attacks, and that's going to give you more opportunities for damage. Eventually, you're going to have your timers on a cooldown. You're going to be able to do it forever, and at which point you probably want to get out of the mess. But anyway, just whilst you do have those abilities, make sure you do that. And when the boss gets kind of low, you can just kind of go ham. Uh, need to keep watch out for your health a little bit here because you can get with the flame and the slicer and the boss's abilities, you can take some quite significant damage. Uh, but you can see here, no real drama on this boss. This was a nice way to do it. And once you've done that, I've seen people run up the right hand side. We discovered you don't need to need to run up the right hand side. You can run straight through the middle uh, and you won't pull any aggro, <laughs> which is good. So just deal with those three mobs. You can run straight up to the middle. Straight up to the middle here, there's these four mobs. You should be able to handle these four mobs as a tank. So I want to berserk him. OK, hold that aggro, stun them all, which if I can, and then get that sacred ground on the floor healer. Thank you for that. So now I can just sit in this. Pop Berserk here and probably apply a little bit of damage if I possibly could. Yeah, so we'll do a heavy attack to cleanse. Maelstrom coming in. Very good. And we just kind of handle this accordingly. No real drama here whatsoever. Sometimes the mobs can get separated a bit. You just want a gravity world to get them back in. Um, our taunt abilities, and it's fine. We've already killed two mobs. So we're just going to deal with these last two, no problem. Okay, so then we're running up to the final boss of this dungeon. The final boss of the dungeon, there is some mechanics you should know about. First fight, we take in the top half. Second, take, second half, we take in the bottom half. Um, you probably need to reapply some foods or coatings, depending on how quickly you've gone in. The convergence cake, for instance, only lasts 25 minutes, so I know I need to reapply it at that point. Uh, again, I'm not going to be doing much damage here, but it is important just while she can wail in some damage, especially if a DPS dies for you to back up and support. So take the thing straight away. Now, the breath attack is the worst attack in terms of damage, I think. It was really significant damage. There is another one that is, that is effective, but the breath can have, hit the whole, whole team. The best way to deal with the breath attack is actually to dodge towards the boss and get behind it, okay? Because it has a really big hitbox, but actually when you look around you, there's this purple, there's this kind of pink line that tells you where the ability is going to be. If you can dodge back three times, you can kind of get out of it. You can also tank it when you have pretty much full stamina. You'll be able to tank that attack. But I think the best thing is to dodge forward, get behind the boss, and the breath will just go past you with taking no damage whatsoever. 
So what you need to do here is what you've done for the rest of the dungeon, the dungeon trades you. So you can see here, look, Breath Attack comes in. I actually saw that purple line and I moved in front of it to get behind the boss. That's the best way to deal with the attack. Um, tank up, shield down when you can to get your stamina regen back. You see here, my stamina is nice and low. So I kind of kite a little bit, get my stamina back, berserk to keep aggro and stat, and then shield back up. That attack there that she throws out the kind of dragon, no matter, even if you have to aggro, can target anyone on the battlefield. So if you see that attack, it's always good to give your team a bit of a warning and say, hey, watch out, she's doing the no aggro attack or the unaggroable attack, whatever you want to call it, um, and they'll be a bit more aware. Once you've done enough damage, the mobs start to spawn him. Um, we again, Taunt, Gravwell, Maelstrom, kill them all really quickly. I won't take down the pedestals at all, and there's a reason for that, but basically you just need to watch out for the pedestals. A second wave of ad spawning. Again, Taunt, Gravwell, Maelstrom. Not as effective this time, but again, it works quite well. Watch out for the pedestals coming in because it does a mini breath attack. You just need to call out so your team keeps an eye out for it. And once we've killed all of these mobs, the boss is going to spawn back in. Boss spawns back in. Now, at this point, the boss is going to throw down some more pedestals, okay? You want to make sure that she's thrown down all of the pedestals and then moves. You can see here we've got four pedestals down. There's the fifth pedestal down, okay? At that point, once the fifth pedestal's down, she's going to do a big attack. Now, a lot of my team takes some significant damage here. At this point, you want to bring the boss completely away. So I just kind of need to really reiterate what you have to do. The reason we stay in the top half in the first section of the fight is to make sure that all of the pedestals are in a really small area. Is then we can take the boss down to the second half of the fight in this bottom area of the map and there's no pedestals now and you can really easily deal with the boss without having the pedestal mechanic to worry about okay so when you're dealing in the top half in the pedestal mechanic section it's really important your group stays together because if your group is disparate and dispersed then the pedestal could be put across the map and having those pedestals spread across the map is the single worst thing that can happen because then you've got to constantly look in your back and manage the map um, you can see here I'm a bit low, but luckily I managed to get further enough away from the dragon attack. We're going to start speaking about some of the other attacks from the boss now and just how to deal with them. So this is the unaggroable attack, so we'll just kind of kite it. Keep an eye out for it. It doesn't do much damage when it does. Um, she's going to do a couple of attacks where we haven't spoken about. So this one attack, the wave attack, dodging again away from the boss is one of the worst things you can do because you end up dodging kind of with the wave and it can hit you. If you actually dodge towards the wave, it's far more effective. You can use the iframes to get through it. If you're not confident on it, sometimes I dodge back by kind of muscle memory and I dodge straight back forward. And that's the best way to do it. So you can see here again, back and forward works super well. Um, the boss has the breath attack. We're going to try and get in front here. I don't manage to do it. So I stick my shield up because I know I won't do it and I end up tanking most of the damage. That's fine. The only other attack is a kind of a big wave attack around the middle that we haven't seen. You, again, you can actually dodge towards the boss in that attack and not get not take some damage or you can just so get out so you can see here i did it there this is the this is the kind of the the wave attack around the middle there i dodged towards the boss and that was absolutely fine you can dodge out to get out of that section so dodge forward that works great and that's a nice ability there to kind of get your um to get your shield bash off to keep aggro in front of the breath is the best thing to do to kind of dodge towards the boss which is so counterintuitive i know you think i want to get away from the boss i need to dodge backwards Actually, dodging forwards here works so well. We got knocked into one of the other dragon breaths there. That was a really unfortunate attack. The knockback was so far that we got knocked back into the pedestal, and that really affected us. Now here, I've got to run. I've got to run and get aggro. And I popped the crowd control ability there, but the boss bloody sprinted off, managed to get aggro back here, and we're going to go get the ranged DPS back up in a second. Unfortunately, he's in a really bad location amongst all the pedestals. I think he might have got knocked or was running around the pedestals when he deals with it. Bit of a pain, but what can you do? The boss is low at this point. We've got 33 seconds on, 33 minutes on the clock, so we're doing well for time. Um, Going to let our DPS keep doing ads in here. Uh, keep doing DPS, sorry. We're, we're well positioned for the rest of the match. We're going to try and get behind the boss here for the breath attack. There you go. It's nice to deal with that. Now, there is an ability here that you haven't really seen. She kind of spits out this red kind of knife at you really quick short attack stabby attack it can deal so much damage like 16k um it's really important you keep your shield up in between these big abilities because that attack can really hurt so if you notice here every time i always have my shield up ready for that attack so shield up coming up now and the timings here are really really clear this boss is not difficult the timings on the attacks are really consistent i think a boss like scylla in lazarus is so much more unpredictable 
Uh, attacks are not telegraphed in the same way. They have awkward timings. This boss is easy because the timings are consistent and the t and the attacks are telegraphed. It's much, 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 much easier to read. But we're probably going to burn the boss now because it's so low. There you go, 800 shards achieved. And we'll show you the score just to show you we got gold. I think we've got like 73,000 points on this run, nice and easy. Um, but yeah, I genuinely feel that this is not a difficult dungeon. I just feel we're a bit rusty on the tactics. So actually, once you go back and do this dungeon a few times, you're not going to have any problems. Mutation 8 isn't that much more difficult. It depends on your modifiers. We've got a modifier on like a fire cleanse. In reality, it does no damage whatsoever, so it's not significant at all. Whether it's different or not on your server, I don't know. Um, but yeah, really easy. The main thing is this dungeon is really, and not just this dungeon, all the mutation dungeons are super gear score dependent. So you can kind of go in, in my experience, you can go in one or two gear score under uh, and get gold relatively with some difficulty, but you can do it. Um, or if you go in less than that, you're going to be dealing half damage, taking double damage. You're going to be having generally a bad time. And what you want to do is you want to have a look at the Umbral Shard reward. So I'll stick an image on your screen now. Sometimes it's worth doing gold at a lower mutation rather than getting bronze at the next mutation mutation from an Umbral Shard's perspective because either the Umbral Shard's kind of uplift is so marginal and taking double the time and spending all of the gold and repairs just isn't really worth it. Sometimes it is worth doing bronze at the next level and you need to think about that. And that brings me to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed that guide through. If you enjoy seeing mutation runs, make sure you drop me a follow on Twitch where I do all of this stuff. And still over 90% of you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel. I really want to get to 2000 subs uh, by the end of this week. So if you can drop me a subscription, I would massively appreciate it from the bottom of my heart and it will allow me to keep producing new world content for all you lovely people. But until next time, everyone, stay safe and keep rocking.